Encounter Night, what's up? Go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, uh, so glad to have you all here with us tonight. It's been like three months since our last Encounter Night. That was way too long. I said, hey, Pastor Ben, let's, let's keep having them throughout the entire year. And Pastor Ben said, no, we have to stop for the summer because people like the beach and traveling, all that fun stuff. Hey, uh, my name is Bobby, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at Calvary. I'm the young marriage pastor here, and it's awesome to be with all of you. I see so many new faces in the room tonight. If it's your first time at an encounter night, could you raise your hand real high for us right now? That's awesome. A whole bunch of people. So good to have you here. Hey, we're going to read our main scripture text for tonight, so go ahead and pull out uh, your Bible uh, if you have that with you. Uh, if you did not bring it with you, it will be on the screen. We're going to be in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, it's in the New Testament. 2 Timothy, starting in chapter 3, verse 14. We'll have it here on the screen for you. Let's read the Word of God together. Verse 14. Paul says this, But as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Chapter four. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship you, to declare you as King and Lord, and now to go into the word together tonight. Lord, may not one of us leave this room the exact same way we walked in, but Lord, may you transform us and speak to us tonight, because we know when the Bible is opened, Lord, you are speaking to us. So we ask that you would bring this truth to our hearts and minds tonight. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen and amen. Hey, tonight I want to introduce you to really the reason in this new year that Encounter Night exists. And tonight we're going to walk through what it means to be a whole life follower of Jesus. A whole life follower of Jesus. We're going to see in our text tonight that, that there are three key things that every one of us need if we really want to surrender our entire lives to him. Three things that we need, and they're right here in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Someone asked me once, hey, if you were stuck on a desert island, uh, which book of the Bible out of all 66 would you have with you? I actually told that person, Second Timothy. Usually it's John's gospel. Usually it's Romans. Usually it's Revelation, something like that. I said Second Timothy. See, there's something special about this one. This is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was one of the biggest figures in Christianity uh, that, uh, of, of all time. And when he wrote this letter, he was in prison. He was in prison in Rome, in Italy, um, months, if not weeks, if not days away from being taken out into a public square and executed by beheading. You actually go to that same square in Rome today where Paul was killed. But there's something about this. If you had one letter left, if you had one communication left in your lifetime, then you would meet Christ face to face, what would you say? So this letter carries a weight about it that I think is very relevant for us uh, as young adults. See, Timothy was a young person. 
He was leading a church in Ephesus, which is actually in modern-day Turkey. And so he was pastoring this Christian community in Ephesus. And, and, and Paul chooses to write his last letter to this young person, possibly in his early to mid-20s. And so for us tonight, Timothy was the future of the church for Paul. But I would argue that every single young adult in this room, every one of us is the future of this church. And so 2 Timothy is for us tonight. So really key things that we need. We're going to pick it up right here in verse 14. But as for you, Paul writes, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The first thing that we need to be a whole life follower of Jesus is this. A whole life follower of Jesus is grounded in truth. A whole life follower of Jesus is grounded in truth. Notice Paul says, hey, continue what you have learned, knowing from whom you learned it. Timothy had a mother and, grandma, and, and uh, his mom's mother who raised him from childhood in the faith. And so Paul mentions this right away. And maybe if you're here tonight, maybe you had someone in your life who you were blessed with to bring you up in the, in the things of God from a young age. I would also say, if you did not have that, don't worry. That you are in a room of people right now who are here for you who want to meet you, know your story, and to really bring the gospel into your life. So just because you did not have someone to bring you up and raise you in this, uh, you are at no disadvantage now. Hear me on that? All right? But notice that Paul says this, something super key, a very, one of the most significant sentences that Paul ever writes in any letter. He says this, the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's it. This is the reason the Bible exists. This is the reason why we exist as the people of God in this room tonight. This one sentence, that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. See, when when Paul wrote this, he was referring to the Old Testament. And this definition would eventually expand to include every book of the New Testament as well. So we're saying really the entire Bible exists to point us to Jesus. And so, hey, you have a Bible. You have a Bible app. I would say, hey, that's great. That's great. My question to you is, has having a Bible and a Bible app, has it brought you to the person of Jesus? Paul writes this. He, doesn't say, he, he, he does not say that, that the Bible automatically brings you to salvation through faith in Jesus. He says the scriptures which are able to. The scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. He's saying, hey, having the scriptures, the sacred writings, owning them, doesn't really say much. Having a Bible app on our phones does not mean we're a Christian. Even walking into a church building for an hour a week, that's great does it really mean we are a Christian. Because what Paul is saying is, you're a Christian if we are wise for salvation, that we know that faith, that salvation comes through faith in Christ Jesus. That's it. Faith in Jesus is the gospel. Or the gospel means good news. It's the point of the entire Bible. Romans 6.23, very quickly, says this. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is an excellent verse, simple gospel explanation that the wages of sin, sin means our shortcoming, failure, that that God has set a standard for us, and sin literally means that you have failed to meet that standard. That even on our best day, on our best behavior, we fall short of where God wants us to be. And so notice notice how Paul says the wages. Wages is what you earned, right? If you work for a boss, you get a what? A paycheck. Everybody say amen for paychecks, right? If you work for a boss, you get a paycheck. You did work, and that work earned you something. 
Paul says our shortcoming, our failure, has earned us one thing with God, eternal death and separation from him. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice Paul contrasts the wages of sin. Hey, you've earned sin, you, sorry, you've earned death and separation from God, but the free gift of God, you didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You did nothing to, for a free gift to come your way. Isn't it great when someone just like gives you free money? Yeah, some people that I know get like a Christmas bonus, cash time, you know, that, that cash at Christmas, it's not a paycheck, it's, it's different, it's separate. It's like, whoa, that was a free gift. Now we earned nothing about that, and that is the free gift. That the Father sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to live that perfect life for us, and now he takes our, our pain, our burdens, our sin, and gives us the life that he lived. He is our perfection, and now the gospel affects every area of our life, all because of what Jesus did for us in that split second. And so this is what the Bible is all about, the gospel, period. And if we make it about anything else, we have missed the point. We've missed it. Actually, if you read through the life of Jesus, he actually points us to this truth multiple times. In Luke's gospel, this is a few days after he walked out of a tomb that he was previously dead in, which is amazing. He's walking on a road outside Jerusalem, and as he's walking, he actually hears two men talking about what happened. They're talking about his death. They're talking about, oh, he got crucified. Yeah, he didn't really make it. The, the story ended not, what we thought should have happened did not happen. And the thing is, these two men, they have the Old Testament. The Old Testament that you have in your Bible right now, these two men had it, and they knew it really, really well. And they thought it was all for nothing, because Jesus died. They thought he had failed in what he had to do. And so here's Jesus, comes up to them, and he says this to their faces. He says this, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, or Messiah, should suffer these things, meaning his torture, his death on the cross, and enter into glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He literally had to say, hey, look, the Bible you've had, it, you've, you've misread it the entire time. I am the point of your scriptures, and you've missed all of it. They missed the gospel that the Messiah was supposed to come and suffer and die to be substituted for the punishment that we deserved. And the gospel is what the Bible is all about. And so Paul, again, Paul is in his last few days of living. And he says, Timothy, continue in this. So for Paul, the gospel was not just the first step. Hey, this is one step and there's a hundred more steps in Christianity, but Paul says, no, continue in this. It wasn't good enough to just know the gospel and then move on. Uh, a, a major myth that exists in our Christian circles is that the gospel is the ABCs of Christianity. As if the gospel is what, what, what we mentioned the kids in nursery. But then us as adults, we move on to bigger and better things. But Tim Keller said this amazing quote. He said, the gospel is not the ABCs. The gospel is the A to Z. It's everything. It's the point. And Paul says, we have to continue in this together. We have to be in the scriptures as they keep pointing us to Jesus over and over and over. So my question to you tonight is, are we spending time, the most valuable currency we have, are we spending time knowing Jesus through reading the Bible? I think, to be honest with you, I think too many of us settle for too little amounts of scripture that we're satisfied with consuming scripture through third parties, meaning that uh, we go everywhere except the Bible to read the Bible. <laughs> Maybe it's a once a day Bible verse. Listen, it pops on my phone every morning at 8.30 a.m., I ignore it. That, that daily Bible verse, ping, I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> what about that social media post that just mentions scripture? or a podcast, or a, a sermon video, and much more. Those are all good things, and I hope, we're, I, I hope we're doing that. 
But hear me out on this. None of those things are a substitute for sitting down and spending your time encountering Jesus in the word of God, the Bible, okay? And here's what, I, I, I thought about this for a long time. I was like, I really think there's two reasons why we're not in the Bible as much as we could be, to really know what we're saying and really know that we know Jesus ourselves. I think the first thing is that we're in a rush. I think life is busy, and we're in a rush. And so if we do read scripture, we check it off and move on to the next thing, right? So I'm, I'm half Italian, and I grew up with an Italian grandmother that would cook us so much food every Sunday afternoon. Anyone grew up with, with, with any like mothers, fathers, grandparents who just cook so much for you? Anybody? Yeah, tons of hands. Awesome, awesome. Thank the Lord for them. And the only word that comes to mind when I think about my experiences every Sunday afternoon for like 10 years, the word is feast. Like we just straight up feasted. We would eat dinner over the course of not one hour, not two hours, three hour dinner. We would have the pasta, the salad, and then the Italian meat. And you would ask, how much Italian meat would you have, Bobby? We would have all the Italian meat, all of it. And we knew we'd be there for a while, right? And so we stayed because we knew what was coming to us if we just stayed. But can you imagine if we went into a three-hour dinner in a rush? We'd run in, oh, hey, we're, we're busy, I gotta go I do this. We sit down, and all we see is the first course, the small bowl of pasta. And we eat it. And I'm like, all right, hey, I'm out. Uh, all I saw right now is just this, and now, now I'm out. It's like, no, wait, you left early. You left early if you had just stayed. You would have had the rest of it. And there's so much more if you would have just waited, but we missed all of it because we were in a rush. Sure, you got a little taste. You got right that little small, hey, you, you, you got that taste, but you missed out on the feast. And so maybe the, the second issue is this. Maybe we settle for too little because sometimes we read something and we're like, I don't understand a word he's saying. But I would also say to that, there's so many great resources that, that you can get uh, this week that will really help you understand your Bible. The first thing, I actually brought one with me tonight. The first thing that I recommend is the ESV Study Bible. Um, it's, uh, I've been a pastor for about five years now, and this, this is my favorite study Bible um, out there. Of course, if you already have one you like, go for it. What I'm suggesting is get yourself a Bible that has study notes on the bottom half of the page. It will help you understand uh, what you are reading, all right? So start with that. You can get it from any book retail. This, 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 the the uh, uh, next resource, um, there's a lot of really cool uh, books that you can get to help you um, as you're going through a Bible reading plan. My favorite one, I, I'm not endorsed by any of these two companies, by the way. This is just a straight up me recommending this. The Bible Recap, thebiblerecap.com. I started this back in January. It's awesome. This young lady in Dallas, Texas made a daily podcast uh, for a daily chronological reading plan over the entire Bible. And over the past two or three years, she has over 20 million downloads uh, of her daily podcast. And so she has a book just called The Bible Recap Plan. It's the podcast in written form. But just take that, write that down, check that out uh, if you'd like to. But I mentioned busyness earlier. Real quick, I just want to harp on this or keep saying this for a second. I, I, I mentioned busyness and like a lot of people in here were like, yes, right? And we're busy. And I know we're busy. I, I hope that everybody in here is um, not a lazy person, that we're going after the things that God has for us. We're working, we're committed to the things that we're in, right? Maybe some of you have like 6 a.m. To, to midnight days and the parents in here are like, yes, we have those. But here's the thing. We always make time for what we value. We always make time for what we value. Everyone's so busy, and then Netflix drops a new season of a show we love. All of a sudden, 48 hours later, we've consumed like a billion and a half hours of content from that next season of the show that we love. Maybe the real reason that our Bibles are being left to the side, or maybe we're not, we're not staying enough in them, because we aren't valuing God enough and how he speaks to us in his word every day. So I ask you tonight, just ask the Holy Spirit tonight 
just to help us value the Bible again. And here it is. Paul actually tells us why the scriptures are so valuable. Verse 16, he says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul uses an incredible word here in verse 16. When he says, breathe out by God, the Greek word for that is theopneustos, that the words that we have here did not find their origin in a human brain. That's what he's saying. He's saying scripture is God-breathed. At the time, he was referring to the Old Testament. But already when Paul writes this, certain, certain books of the Bible are already being assembled by the Christian community and saying, yes, this is divine origin. This is about Jesus. This is about the gospel. This was written by, a, by one of the 12 apostles. And therefore, it has authority in our lives. Paul says this, scripture is useful because for, for, for these four things, for teaching. See, when you and I read the Bible every day, we're being taught by the Holy Spirit. And maybe if we're not reading the scripture, maybe we're actually, we're actually saying the Lord is, I'm actually good, I have all this on my own, I don't need any input from you. How about reproof and correction? Same kind of thing. When we read God's word, we are being brought into continual alignment with God's perspective. Just see, that's what the Bible is. That's God's perspective on us, our fallen world, and what Jesus has done for us. The last thing is we're, we're being trained in righteousness. This is what we're talking about, the, the righteousness that Jesus gives us because of the gospel. And so he, Paul's saying, you want to be in the scriptures? You'll be trained in the gospel you'll know what you're actually talking about the more time you spend. And so that's great, right? You're like, hey, Pastor Bobby, I get it. But if I do this, I'll turn out that way. This would be great. My question for you is where does this happen? In what context do we live this out? How can we live as complete and equipped for every good work? I brought a little baseball with me here tonight. I... Uh, Got this from a, a batting practice uh, game at Fenway Park. The uh, bullpen catcher actually tossed me this baseball uh, after the Red Sox bullpen, so uh, pretty cool back in the day. But think about baseball. If I explain this to you, I'm telling you about the game of baseball. I'm saying, hey, this is a baseball, and that guy over there has a wooden stick, and I'm going to throw this towards him. His goal is to hit it behind me. My goal is to throw it past him. If he hits it past me, I can, he can run the bases and score a point. Everyone's like, yes, that's so great. But what I didn't tell you is, where is baseball played? If all I told you was just the rules of baseball and moved on, I would have missed something. Because I, I, I wouldn't have told you, hey, like, where is this sport played, and how can I go be a part of it, Right? So same with, with us, how can we live out the gospel? How can you and I move beyond just knowing about gospel truth and actually live out gospel truth? And there's one word that we're going to focus on tonight. It's called community. Community. We're going to define community from Acts chapter 2, how people lived with the truth of the gospel. So Peter had just preached the gospel publicly for the first time after the death of Jesus and 3,000 people responded and said yes. So look what happened right after that. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. I'm going to read it to you here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The second thing that we need to live, to be a whole life follower of Jesus is this. A whole life follower of Jesus is committed to community. 
committed to community. See, community is where the truth of the gospel is lived out. And actually, I'm, I'm going to hit a little hard on this. Community is not just making friends. It's not just um, doing fun things together. It, it's more than just us and, and a few friends playing some uh, board games or having dinner at someone's house and talking about the three topics that we all talk about, news, sports, and weather, right? Community is this. It's people who have fully surrendered themselves to Jesus, meaning that they, uh, their entire lives are now subject to his lordship and his ownership, that you, along with the people that are, are in your life, are no longer doing your life your way. But we align ourselves with Christ on a daily basis for our lives, our education. If you're married, our, our marriages, our schooling, our friends, every aspect of our lives comes under his lordship. Notice Acts chapter two. Luke actually echoes what Paul writes in 2 Timothy. Paul says, uh, uh, Luke says this, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is that? The apostles' teaching is the gospel, that the Son of God has been sent here to earth. He lived the perfect, righteous life, died on the cross for your sins, and now has ascended to the throne of the Father, that he has done this for you, and salvation from our sin is now available in Christ Jesus. So they align themselves with the gospel, right? And Paul says the exact same thing. Timothy, continue in this. Don't leave this behind, Anchor yourselves in it because it forms everything we are as the people of God. I think sometimes what, what can happen is we actually become baseball fans in church. Meaning that we know all about the game, but all of a sudden we make it a spectator sport. We're great at watching, we're awesome at spectating, but all of a sudden we've stopped doing the things that we know a follower of Christ does and lives out. So we have to be committed to community for us to be able to live this out. Last part here. Paul writes this, chapter four, verse one. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living in the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. See, Paul reminds us who is really in charge. That we are to live in the present already knowing what's gonna happen in the future. See, when, when Paul says preach the word, he's saying, yo, the word is scripture. Scripture points to what? The gospel. Right? The scripture exists to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, the gospel. Paul saying, yo, focus on Jesus with your life right now in this room. Paul is pointing us, focus on the point. We can't miss it. There was an interesting quote that made its way around a few years ago. It, it said this, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Now, I, I wish that person was grounded in truth when they said that. Because honestly, we see this nowhere in the Bible. The, the thought of like, hey, I, I hope my life speaks loud enough so that I'll never actually have to share my faith with anybody. Because my life will just do it for me. I'm not on TikTok, thank the Lord. No, I'm kidding, if you are, that's fine. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm not judging you, I promise. But I, I was told, I have some sisters and they're, un, they're into it and they love it. And, and I was told that there's a trend on TikTok right now that basically says, I, 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 th I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting this right, um, tell me something without actually telling me something. Is that happening right now? Can you imagine if we did that with the gospel? <laughs> like, Tell people the gospel without actually ever telling people the gospel. <laughs> to be totally honest with you, I think that's less than stellar advice for us as God's people. Look, of course, Jesus says, let your light shine before people, right? Of course, our lives will have an impact on people who are not believers, and they'll see what your life is, whether you like it or not. 
the thing is, people can look at you and see something. That's great. Hey, this person does marriage differently. Hey, that guy treats women at his college differently. But for that to end there would be, I think, would be a total mistake on our part because people have to know what that something is. So Peter tells us, tell people the reason that you have for your hope, not just that you have hope. Hey, you have hope? Excellent, so happy for you. you know, Peter says, hey, tell people the reason why you have this hope. He's saying the gospel needs to be communicated to people. So Paul tells us this here. Paul says this, be ready in season and out of season. He's saying, basically, be ready when it's convenient for you, that you're ready to go, you're prayed up, and you're, and you're ready to talk to somebody about Jesus, but also when it's not convenient, when you're really busy, when we're stressed, when we have a big schedule that day, be ready in that moment to communicate the truth of the gospel to that person. Paul also says this, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I encourage you, if you're really close with some really Christ-believing friends who are going after him as hard as you're going after him, don't be afraid to say to them in love with complete gentleness, hey, look, I, I don't think that's it. Let me, let me show you what I think could really be happening. It's like going on a hike with friends and you're all going up that trail together and one of your friends kind of goes off the trail and you're like, hey, what's, what's, hey we're going up that way? If you go that way, that's off the trail. You're lost, right? I'm going to call them back with us. And here's the reason why we're being called to do this tonight. Verse 3. Paul says this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I'm not sure if you guys would agree with me tonight, but I think that time has arrived that Paul is talking about, and we've actually been in this time for a long time. Notice how Paul says, people will not endure sound teaching. In other words, they're going to be okay with wandering away from the gospel. They will start to not be on board with it anymore. Notice how they says, Paul says, they're going to have itching ears. In other words, they're going to have desires that really go uh, against God's will and what he wants for our lives. They're going to put themselves first in their life, and they're going to have no ear for the gospel because their hearts are slowly turning away from God. And Paul tells us what happens at the end, that they turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. What is possibly the biggest myth in our society right now? How about, I'm living my truth? Have you heard that from anybody recently? That they are living their truth. I was talking to some people about this, and they said, I was talking with them, and we were talking about that when people say this, what they really mean is, I'm going to ignore what is true and live out what I want to be true. And so really what they want to do is live out their illusion. Because an illusion is, some, is something that is pretending to be true, but really isn't. It, it, it produces a, a false impression of reality. That's an illusion. And there are so many people that think that they can live their truth. They want, they want to pursue what is true for them. Matt Chandler, a, a, a pastor, amazing writer, speaker, he says this. He says, contrary to popular opinion, truth is not fluid and inside of us. Truth is outside of us and it is fixed. Did you catch that? Truth is not fluid and inside of us, but truth is outside of us and it is fixed. So truth is not what we want it to be. Our opinion matters nothing at all to truth. It's fixed. And so people are going for this myth. 
they're drifting away from Jesus. All of this stuff is happening. They say that they're going to go find people who agree with them just to really not want anything to do with the gospel and wander off into myths. So, oh no, now what? Do we shrink back, right? Do we say, hey, people are, are, are doing their own thing these days, man. I'm going to stay home and let them do what they want to do. No, Paul actually gives us our answer, right? This is what you and I do as the people of God together, as our response to all that is happening in our world today. Verse five, Paul says this, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. The third thing that you and I need to be whole life followers of Jesus is this. A whole life follower of Jesus lives life on mission. A whole life follower of Jesus lives life on mission. See, this is our response. This is how we live in response to everything that's happening in our society today. And Paul just gives a really simple, short list. I'm going to end with this. Paul says, firstly, be sober-minded. Basically, he's saying, let nothing have control over you, your physical body, except the Spirit of God. That includes what? That includes um, not giving yourself over to alcohol, to be incapacitated, right? To not give yourself over to a narcotic that would take you places that God has not designed for you to go, right? To remain clear, to have clarity, to be focused. Second thing is endure suffering. This one, this one hits different. This is tough. We hope Paul would say, hey, hey, Paul, can you be more encouraging with me tonight, please? Can you just give me like a nice, quiet, peaceful word from God for my life? Paul says, yes, endure suffering. Endure suffering. I would encourage you guys, please don't think that God is absent in your life when hard times come. Right? Don't, that, don't, don't think that he's absent when unexpected things happen, when tragic things happen. Don't bail out when things get hard in that moment. God actually promises you peace. Do you know that? He says, my peace I give to you. That peace that he promises us, it's not the absence of problems. And maybe so many of us think that, hey, when I said yes to Jesus, now my life will be just great. I can live out my American dream life to the best of my ability. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to have lots of money. It's going to be great. Thank you, Jesus. You have to know that God will be with you always, no matter your circumstance. See, we connect the goodness of God for some reason to how well our, our lives are going. If, if, if our lives are not what we thought they would be, we blame who? We blame God. But God tells us that he is always good. That his goodness is our firm foundation, that we can always trust him. The peace that he promises us is that he's with us through any hard time, through the tragedy, through any suffering that you have to go through in your life. His peace means not the absence of problems or trouble, but he's present with us through it. Not a text we hear often, but Jesus actually, this is weird, he actually promises us that we, that we will have trouble. John 16, verse 33, this is Jesus. He says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or troubles but take heart. He says, I have overcome the world. And so Paul is saying, listen, endure suffering. God will bring you through it, not away from it, not to escape it, but he says, God is with you to bring you through that. Paul says, endure it, keep going. So we're to be sober-minded, endure suffering. Now the third thing, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. This is for every one of us tonight, not just someone who calls himself an evangelist and has, it, has a, a card in the ministry, but this is our active response to people turning away from the truth of the gospel. Do we push them away? 
Do we say, hey, leave, you're not welcome in our circle? No, no, no. We continue pointing them to Jesus as much as they want to hear that from us. Ted Cunningham, if you um, are married tonight, or if, if you want to be married in the future, go back and check out Ted Cunningham's videos from our marriage conference in April. It was awesome, did a great job. But he has this quote, and I, he said this, and I was like, I have to put this in the message. It was so good. He says this, as those around you drift from truth, don't go with them. Stand your ground. He said, joining others in their drift from truth does not make you a more loving and kind person. He said, speak the truth in love. And so my question to us tonight is, very simply, can you communicate, can you articulate the truth of the gospel? Can you have a gospel conversation with somebody who does not know it, who's brand new to church, brand new to Jesus, or can you talk to somebody who's been in church their entire life but missed the point? Can you communicate the simplicity, the truth of the gospel to people? And don't forget, the gospel's not the ABCs, right? The gospel is the A to Z. I think there's a lot of fear, though, when it comes to sharing our faith, right? We fear rejection. What will they, that person think of me now if I venture out on that limb and share Christ with them? There's a lot of fear. Uh, I'm friends with a, a pilot here in our church family, and uh, we would text about stuff, and he would tell me about what kind of planes he's flying for a, a, a big airline. And so we talk, and one day he texted me, and he said, hey, um, get your wife and bring her up to this local airport. I want to take you and your wife up in my uh, Piper uh, prop plane. I was like, oh, awesome. I was like, we, we, we've been on uh, big jumbo jets, but never on like a small, uh, you know, private plane. And so he took us up, uh, got to the airport, super cool. We, we got the drive like right onto the runway. It was just, I felt like super executive for a second there. It was, it was great. But he put us in the plane, put the headphones on, really, really cool. It was a four-seater, so my wife was right behind me, and this guy is right next to me on my left, and we're up front, and the, and the controls are right there. And we're taxiing for takeoff. We're coming around the final curve before the huge runway where every plane takes off from. And he goes, okay, you ready? I'm like, yeah. He goes, no, you got takeoff. I said, uh, what? He's like, you got it from here. I said, oh, uh, I've actually never flown in a small plane before. My hands have never touched the controls of any plane ever. He's like, you're good. Listen to everything I tell you, and we're fine. And he, this man gave me no time to respond. He radios the tower, gives them confirmation in plane speak, and then we're going. He, he pumps off the brake, and our plane starts moving around the corner, and we're right here. And we're on the runway, about to take off. And he's like, okay, do this. Push the throttle forward, and I'm like, I, I'm shaking my hands. I'm holding the thing so hard that my, literally, my fist, I'm not exaggerating, my fists were white. Any blood had left my fists. Listen, I have fear of heights and my first time in a small plane. So this man was telling me, hey, you're going to take this plane up 4,000 feet into the air. I'll tell you when to level off. So we do it. And he's like, okay, now push down the throttle, go. I'm like, okay. He's like, push it down. All right, now uh, when I say uh, V1, pull back on your throttle. I'm like, okay. And he says, V1, I pull back, and the plane takes off. And my wife is in the background. I hear my wife going, <laughs> I can't describe adequately for you the feeling of fear that hit the depth of my soul when he said, you're taking us up in this plane. Look, it was fine, professional pilot with 40 years of experience in huge jets, much bigger than this small one. And it was actually, uh, there were two controls there. I had this one, he had that one. He could have hit a button on his dashboard and transferred control back to his side. So it was under control, I think, I hope. But for me, I was scared because that was unfamiliar territory. Out of fear of heights, and we're going to go up 4,000 feet with one inch of metal between me and my death, and my wife's death, and this guy's death. It'll be, all be my fault, too. 
But I was scared because it was unfamiliar territory. I was being asked to do something that I had no clue where to even start. And so I think for evangelism, I think something really, really simple is just get around somebody uh, who is not new to it. There are plenty of people in this room, I promise you, they're gonna be wearing group leader lanyards tonight. Talk to them, right? They are here for you. They would love uh, to meet you. Again, they'll help you, art- help you learn, help you articulate the truth of the gospel from your own life to other people. So don't let fear hold you back. The last thing that Paul tells us, he says, fulfill your ministry. I want you to know tonight that you have a ministry from God that you were not placed here on this planet by accident. Uh, You being present in this church family is uh, not an accident, right? There are no such thing as coincidences uh, that the Lord has an assignment from heaven for your life. You have a purpose. It might be, hey, it might be a, hey, I'm called to do this with my life full time, vocationally, missionary, worship leader, pastor, whatever. But for most of us, It won't be that. But you still have a ministry from heaven. You have a purpose. So I'd encourage you, do what you uh, can do to really discover your purpose, how you can use your life to fulfill what Jesus commands all of us, that our lives would make disciples, right? That we would be a follower of Christ ourselves, and that from the fruit of that, we would see people around us also come to a saving faith in Christ and become disciples whole life followers of Jesus. Notice how Paul includes all four of these things. Can you imagine if everybody in here adapted these four things to their lives, that every single one of us would would live life sober-minded, fully in control, to exhibit actually what is a fruit of the Spirit, self-control, if we were sober-minded, if we endured suffering, instead of crying a ton about it, pushing back on God, being angry. But no, we endured suffering because God is with us through it. What if we actually communicated the gospel point for point with people around us? Hey, God loves you. And what if we actually fulfilled our ministries? That we realized that we do have a calling from heaven, that you have an assignment to live out in this life. As we end tonight, could you think about this with me just for one minute? What are we seeing in society today, in in our world, this world we live in? We're seeing a lack of gospel truth. A lack of gospel truth. We're seeing an absence of biblical community. Not just friends getting together, but like, hey, these people are going after Jesus. I'm going to join them in my pursuit of God as well. We're seeing a lack of that. We're also seeing Christians living for themselves, or maybe people who are calling themselves Christians living for themselves and not on mission. But in response to that, what would the impact be if just us in this room tonight if we all committed to being whole life followers of Jesus, what impact would that have in just this town or your town? People who are grounded in in the truth of God's word. People who are committed to community. People who live life on mission. There would be a revival bigger than any of us could expect or dream about. And this is really in this new year, this is why Encounter Night exists. It would be a mistake for us to have you here once a month and be satisfied with you being in a seat for an hour and a half. We would be mishandling this gift, this grace that God's given us during this season if that's what we were satisfied with. So this is why Encounter Night exists. We exist to see a whole life commitment to Jesus in the young adults of the North Shore of Boston. Let me pray with you right now that we're gonna worship together one last time before we go. Lord, I pray for every person in this room tonight. Lord, I pray, first, I I thank you that you see and know everything about everyone in this room. I thank you, Lord, that you are for us. 
Lord, that, that the gospel is for us tonight. It's not just for the non-believer, but Lord, the gospel is for believers. It's everything. So Lord, we apologize if we've moved away uh, from Jesus as the core of our faith. Lord, we pray that we would be grounded in truth. That we would preach the gospel to ourselves and others on a regular basis. Lord, we ask tonight that we would be committed to community. That we would understand that, that people around us are, are not perfect, Lord, but Lord, that uh, you are working in their life just as much as you're working in ours. And Lord, so Lord, help us to, again, uh, band together with people who want to go after you and make it their whole life commitment. Lord, we ask for everybody in this room who thinks that they, um, that they're, that them being alive is purposeless. We pray for the people in this room who think that they don't have a purpose tonight. Lord, may you speak love and mission and purpose and dreams into their, the depth of their soul tonight, that they do matter. Lord, that you have a spot for them in your kingdom and that, Lord, you want to use them to grow your kingdom, Lord. So we pray for everyone in this room. Help us, Lord. In, 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 in Christ's name we pray, amen.